Namaskar, good afternoon. Bombay Management Association welcomes you to the Friday Fundamentals Learning Series. It's indeed my pleasure to welcome in our midst Dr. Zubin Mullah from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. For me, TISS is nostalgia because that's the place where I began my teaching career before I moved on into other roles and responsibilities. Of course, continuing in the academic world itself. But today it is my privilege to welcome and introduce to you Dr. Zubin Mullah. Of course, he is an engineer initially, who then was very, very keen to get into the field of academics after he had a stint in the corporate world, including in leading organizations like Godridge and Boyce. Subsequently, over the last 15 years, has been in the academic world as one of the well-known persons in the field of research, consultancy, has authored a lot of articles and is one of the most popular and successful teachers at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. He believes in a lot of research in fields like training, leadership, and so on. I owe it to Dr. Indrapal Singhji, our former president of the Bombay Management Association, for having suggested that we could have Zubin Mullah to take a session for us on the learnings of someone who is not so popular as a Peter Drucker in the field of management, but with over 25 books in the field of management, he has set a lot of many, many meaningful principles in the areas of management. So based on Eloy Jack's theories and publications, here is a session for us by Dr. Zubin Mullah. Thank you, Zubin, for your ready acceptance. And it's our honor to have you at the Bombay Management Association. We hand over to you to take us through this learning journey this evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Mani, for very generous introduction. Uh, thanks to uh, BMA and Professor Mani for inviting me. And uh, I don't know how much I can thank uh, Mr. Indrapal Singh for all his support. He is responsible for me being here. Otherwise, I would have been an engineer in Godrej and Boyce still. So thank you so much uh, for this invite. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, a particular aspect of Elliot Jack's work. Elliot Jack's, uh, as Professor Mani mentioned, is um, one of the most versatile and most original management thinkers. He also has a very interesting background. He started off as a medical doctor, trained as a psychoanalyst, ended up as a management scientist. And some of the most, uh, you know, uh, widest range of contributions, right from organization culture to midlife crisis, to stratified systems theory, which I would say is one of the coherent uh, parts of his work. And uh, I recently got to know that he has also done some work on pricing from Mr. Indrapal Singh, which I was not aware of. Now, uh, Elliot Jacks had a very uh, different take on management science. In fact, he had a huge amount of disdain for the conventional approach to management. In fact, he said that management is pretty much like what medical sciences were in the uh, 17th century with things like, you know, putting uh, uh, bloodletting and things like that in order to get people to cure. He says we need to be more evidence based. We need to use more uh, science and data. In fact, there is an interesting story where at a conference where he was presenting his ideas, because very often his ideas seem to be quite radical. And some of them will seem to you also quite radical, though intuitively appealing. Uh, you know, someone challenged him. And he just started off by asking them, do you know what is the definition of work? And you've been around, you know, in uh, doing research and management for so long. Can you just define work for us? And people were quite astounded at that time. So that was his approach. He would start from the very basics and build his theory up from the basics. And a very comprehensive and coherent uh, approach is what has been the stratified systems theory. His basic theory starts by talking about what is called a managerial accountability hierarchy. He says people come together and form an association. Typically, it's a group of peers. So if you look at a board of directors or shareholders, they're a group of peers who have come together in order to get some common purpose. In the case of an organization, it is profit. In case of a university, the professors come together for a, uh, to create a center of learning. Doctors come together to do healing uh, operations, etc. Now, each of these associations 
is governed by a system of governance this then this association then appoints what is called as a managerial accountability hierarchy and it is within this managerial accountability hierarchy that 90% of us who are currently on this webinar and guessing function we are one of the you know links in this chain which uh, uh, he calls a managerial hi accountability hierarchy and the uniqueness of a managerial accountability hierarchy is that work and accountability they cascade down several levels and if you see an example over here x who is reporting to the ceo holds y accountable for two things one is y's own personal effectiveness and z's output so it is this part where stratified system theory works and there are broadly five contributions which we will touch upon today first we will talk about work complexity now work complexity is at the heart of his theory and we'll try to understand what is work complexity we will see how work complexity is then used to decide work levels and gives you a kind of a template for an org structure after that we will look at within an org structure how should x relate to y and how should y relate to z and how should x relate to z is what we will look at after that we will look at identifying human capability which also draws from work complexity trying to see how work identifying human capability can help us to staff the right person in the right job according to elliot jacks if you have designed your organization right and if you have put the right person in the right job then pretty much things should work fine and finally we will look at fair pay system which is one of the other contributions of elliot jacks so first let's understand the entire theory in a nutshell and then we'll dive deep into each one element so first is work complexity work comes in different levels of complexity it is this work complexity that leads to having a kind of organization structure because different levels of complexity will happen at different levels in the org structure it is also this level of work complexity which helps us to categorize human capabilities different individuals have different capabilities in terms of dealing with complexity some of us are better some of us uh, are not so good it is this human capability which is then matched with organization structure organization structure gives rise to two principles which is accountability and authority and we will see how these two need to be balanced and how they are related and organization structure and human capability gives us the concept of fair rewards and which again links up with work complexity so you will find this is a highly integrated kind of system where everything links up to each other to give you a kind of unified whole so he develops a total management system in which you have organization structure management processes uh, pay levels and a system for evaluating human capability let's start with trying to understand complexity in a little more detail according to jacks complexity in a task does not agree, exist in the goal goals are not complex you want to increase your organization net worth by a certain amount you want to increase revenue by a certain amount you want to launch new products you want to have a presence in different kind of geographies there is no complexity in the goal the complexity is in the path to reach the goal in fact he gives an example let us say you want to catch a flight from here to ladakh you want to go to ladakh going to ladakh is not complex in inherently if you want to take a flight and go to ladakh it may be relatively straightforward but if you want to go by road to ladakh then perhaps complexity is introduced now what is the source of this complexity the source of this complexity comes because of the number of variables that you need to deal with so if i need to go to ladakh by road perhaps i need to know what time of the year it is what is going to be the climate at that time whether the roads are good enough whether there are any security clearances so on and so forth when you need to deal, deal with more number of variables complexity increases sometimes identification of those variables is not clear sometimes you don't even know what are the variables that you need to deal with particularly in a business when you are starting a new business or looking at high level of growth you may not even know what are the variables that you need to look at some variables are changing all the time so the rate of change of variables adds to the complexity and finally these variables are all impacting each other it's not like each variable is purely independent so the extent to which these variables are interwoven or interrelated adds to the complexity so well, this is fairly straightforward but elliot jacks key insight which is what is written here in red is that complexity in organization tasks does not increase on a continuous scale but in discrete levels each qualitatively different from others and i think this is the main heart of what elliot jacks wants to say 
it's something like he gives the metaphor of ice water and steam just as we have ice water and steam which are three different states solid liquid and gas and they are visibly different similarly he says that in organization it's not a linear scale now this is where most of our job evaluation systems go wrong because they assume that it's a linear scale if you spent 5 years in this job now you're ready for the next job you spent 3 4 years in that job now you're ready for the next job so that kind of thinking is challenged by elliot jacks where he says that the complexity in organization life arises on a discrete scale and not in a continuous scale what does this discrete scale look like so he describes that according to him this complexity is broadly seven levels so almost all organizations according to elliot jacks can be uh, uh, the work in most organizations can be classified along seven levels of complexity which he calls as strata this strata is something we'll be using throughout essentially it reflects different levels of complexity at the lowest level of complexity he says we need to overcome obstacles and use practical judgment that is when people need to use let us say a bank teller's job or a clerical job or a manual lathe machine operator's job is typically falling under the first category where the task is set the objects are in front of you you need to manipulate the objects in order to get some work done the objects may be a soft copy word document it may be a hard copy real instrument filing the typing etc slightly above that he calls it the task of diagnostic accumulation where you have a first line manager or a specialist so most engineers mbas supervisors would fall under the stratum 2 where he talks about diagnostic accumulation now that is the point where you are able to deal with slight more abstractions we are able to diagnose why problems are happening you are able to prevent problems from happening the third level which is called as unit manager is a manager of a manager so the first line manager's manager here you need to create alternative pathways to encompass the whole process and have pre planned alternative paths to change if needed so here you are looking at a slightly more conceptual thing where you are not even in touch with the reality in terms of the ground level neither are your immediate subordinates in touch with the ground level but you need to look at broad level plans how to achieve something these people would typically be department heads these people would typically be uh, you know senior police officers who would be looking at a complete department or a function above that you have the general manager which is the stratum 4 where you look at several interacting process you don't just look at one function perhaps you're looking at multiple functions and you're managing trade offs between tasks in order to achieve the end goal something like a new product development may come under stratum 4 or in some cases stratum 5 stratum 5 is where you're a business unit uh, president this is where you need to now look at not just the internal organization but you also need to start looking at the environment and the outside world and the interaction between the organization and the environment above that now most organizations most organizations would end at a unit 5 what that means is if the organization does not have too much of complexity your ceo may be at unit 5 but if your organization has much more complexity and you need to have a ceo at level 6 or a evp at level 6 where you are overseeing complex systems this is where you need to look at what are the various investment priorities and worry about the long term success of the organization and at the top level there is a stratum 7 this is the state at which you are actually constructing a complex system that means you are identifying what are the needs of the society what are the types of businesses i need to get into something like what maybe steve jobs or uh, jeff bezos does when he conceives of amazon and its growth or steve jobs conceives of an ipod or something like that so it's that level of uh, thinking this may seem a little fuzzy right now but we'll try to make it a little more tangible as we move ahead he also explains this in terms of three bands he talks about the operational band so at the very first level our focus is on making or doing something at a certain level of quality the next level is to ensure some kind of consistency and the kind of tools we use are schedules checklists and meetings the third level is at the level of practice where you are trying to put in place best practices business process reengineering etc the then the next band is the organization management where you have strategic development which is stratum 4 and you have strategic intent which is stratum 5 the top level where you talk about corporate citizenship and corporate prescience 
is where you're either sustaining the organizational unit over a period of time, or you are looking at creating new environments for future generations. So that's where I said you're looking at, you know, what Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos was kind of looking at, at the top level. He even gives a clear checklist how each one of us, let us say you want to know what level of complexity you are working at. He gives a detailed checklist where individuals can ask themselves these questions. And based on that, they can figure out what level they are working at. So in the interest of time, I'll not be going through each and every slide, but these slides are already available to Professor Mani and he'll circulate it to you at the end of the uh, session. Now comes the next big insight of Elliot Jacks. The next insight what Elliot Jacks suggested is that this job complexity is reflected in what is called as the time span of discretion. Time span of discretion is defined as what is the maximum target completion time of all the tasks that you have to do. So let us take some examples. Let us say you're looking at a manual or a clerical work. Typically a manual or a clerical work, let us say a bank teller, a security guard, a typist would have a time span of discretion of one day to two months. That means his or her supervisor would have given them some work. And typically within that one day or at the most three months, that person would have some freedom to do the work where no one would come and check whether the work is being done to a certain quality of standard or not. So the time span of discretion, that is the time that that individual is left free to determine the uh, way in which the work should be done, the pace in which the work should be done is maximum three months. Then when we come to the first line specialist, for this, we can imagine somebody like a production manager. Here, the person will have a target of between three to uh, 12 months, between three months to one year. What that means is, this person may have tasks like uh, recruit and hire and train new employees. Make sure that this line is ready for production in the next uh, quarter. So this person would have targets or work which would typically be three to 12 months. At a higher level, at a unit manager level, let us say uh, somebody who's working as a training manager. Here you may have a kind of a target that design and institute an on the job training program at multiple plants. So you have multiple plants, you need to create an induction program, roll it out over many plants. This is typically one to two years time span of discretion. At a higher level, when you look at general manager, you will have a time span of discretion of between two to five years. Let us say there is an organization which is in the pre-1990 uh, era and they only used to taking orders from the customer. They are not used to actually actively marketing or selling. And you want to change the culture of the organization from what it was to what it needs to be given the new en environmental changes. So you're given a task between the next two to three years or at the most in five years, change the culture of this company so that people are more market oriented, etc. So that would be kind of two to five years task. The business unit president would have a slightly higher time span of discussion, five to 10 years. Let us say the company needs to change its focus from one technology to a different technology. You're currently working on an old technology and you need to move to a different kind of technology. So what kind of processes, recruitments, uh, investments do we need to do to move from one kind of technology to another? At the EVP level, you have 10 to 20 years. What kind of investments do you need to do? What kind of organizations do we want to acquire? Which geography should we be in? So on and so forth. And at the highest level, stratum seven, you have a time span of discretion of greater than 20 years. This is where, as I said, you know, people like uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or uh, Steve Jobs are operating. What is going to happen in the next 20 years? What kind of so social movements are going to happen? What kind of exports are going to be per permitted? What is going to happen to China? What is going to happen to US-China relationship? This kind of thinking happens at the seventh level of at the seventh stratum. And uh, Elliot Jacks did some studies and he found that this time span of discretion, which he actually just stumbled on accidentally, had a strong correlation with the kind of pressure people felt on their work. So most of us feel some pressure, particularly when we move from one job to another job, we feel a certain pressure in that job. And he felt that that pressure which you feel is relating to the time span of discretion. Because the time span of discretion tells you how far into the future are you planning your work. And that determines the number of variables, the kind of variables, and the kind of complexity that your work has. He also found an interesting finding, which we will talk about in detail later on, that the time span of discretion actually linked 
with what was called as the felt fair pay that means when people were told about jobs like you know uh, jeff bezos or steve jobs that they have this kind of work how much should they be paid or this is your evp this is the kind of job he has how much should he or she be paid almost all of them the correlation between the number that they said which is called as felt fair pay correlated very well with the time span of discretion which is i think his central discovery uh, elliot jacks's central discovery so time span of discretion uh, is a measure of the size of the job and its position in the uh, hierarchy uh, there are tools available in order to calculate the time span of discretion and those who are trained in elliot jacks approach uh, would actually ask you typically what are the tasks that you do and how far into the future do you plan for doing these tasks or they would ask you that how long are you doing these tasks without your supervisor intervening or without you having to go to your supervisor with that coupled with the kind of decision making that you're doing and the nature of problem solving the measure of the job can be decided that means whether the job is a stratum 1 stratum 2 and so on up to stratum 7 it can be determined these are some simple heuristics for uh, all of us if you want to know what work level your job is so three questions one is consider your job as a whole and how far does your job permit you to plan ahead so some of us let us say my own job as a teacher uh usually for most jobs uh you know if i take my teaching job it makes me plan ahead for one semester so one semester for us is 6 months at the most if i am involved in some administrative work let us say i am also chairperson of the center or something like that then i may need to plan for one year because the batch comes in and the batch completes that one year you plan for one year but let us say when you talk about uh, guiding a phd student for example or designing a research project for example at that time the time span may be 4 or 5 years that means the level of complexity of your job will be determined by that task which has the maximum time span of discretion and then there are some two other questions that how how much time do you need to wait to get the know the impact of your decision and finally to what extent does your job involve planning versus doing activity so these are heuristics which people have developed based on elliot jacks's work in order to determine the time span of discretion building on this time span of discretion elliot jack now talks about what constitutes a requisite organization requisite means as defined by nature what the nature requires now remember the nature of work is complexity complexity is defined by time span of discretion time span of discretion is reflected in the various seven strata so here he says what is a requisite organization he says requisite organization requires your manager to be at least one stratum above you not at least sorry exactly one stratum above you now very often we find that we are stifled by our manager and we are going to our manager just for the sake of uh, the fact that that person is our manager this happens very often because organizations have a huge hierarchy and in that hierarchy they have people who are clustered so close to each other because they've not applied these principles of requisite organizations that very often you find that your manager does not give you value add and that manager is almost breathing down your neck any of you should be smiling now if you relate to this so that is happening when your manager is of the same stratum as you are in rare cases it may happen that there is a stratum missing in between in such cases you can't make sense of what the manager is saying it's like your manager is talking futuristically 10 20 years hence and you can only see the here and now what should be done in the next 3 months and what should be done in the next 3 months has no connection with what should be done 5 years 10 years from now so that is again a mismatch not a good thing the best thing is when your manager is just one stratum ahead in that case you will feel that you really get support from the manager if we extrapolate this whole thing to a large organization there are three ways in which you see so if you see the first uh, uh, diagram on the left hand side this is what is called as a manifest this is the way the organization looks now you see over here that instead of merely seven strata this organization has got far more than seven strata you find people are cluttered next to each other in such a case according to elliot jacks what will happen is nature will find a way and people will practically be jumping over their managers if you see the red lines in the second diagram the red lines represent how people will be skipping levels because they will get inputs so mr j i and h will not get any inputs from each other but they will get inputs only from g because g is at the separate level at the significantly higher level then h i and j similarly 
uh, G will not get any inputs from F or E because they form in the same stratum as uh, G and G will get inputs from D. So this is called the extent organization. That means how it actually works. And that can be then converted into what is called as a requisite organization, how it ought to be. So ideally, uh, if you are faced with an organization like this, you ought to restructure it so that you ensure that you have one person per strata and an individual does not report to somebody within his or her own strata because that's the only way the person will feel a value add from his or her manager. So, so far we have talked about some of these things. We've talked about work complexity. We've talked about organization structure and we've seen how time span of discretion links work complexity with organization structure. We will now talk about accountability and authority. We'll also talk about human capability. And finally, we will talk about fair rewards. Now coming to accountability and authority. Here, I think uh, this was for me the most intuitively appealing thing and having worked in many organizations, I've often felt this pressure. I guess you will also relate to this. If A holds B accountable for the output of C, then the B must have minimum authority in relation to C to do the following. First is B should have the authority to veto appointment of unacceptable newcomers. B should have the authority to decide what kinds of work and assignments and what kinds of tasks he or she can give C. He should have the freedom to decide how the appraisal should be done and when the, uh, how the merit review should be done in terms of what should be the outcome of the appraisal and the merit review. And finally, B should have the authority to initiate removal from role with due process. This is removal from role, not from the organization. This is a very important concept. And I see many organizations, this is completely violated. You will find numerous cases where either we are not accountable for the work that others do with us, or we are accountable without having any authority in relation to them. So, you know, you will have some kind of mismatch over here. And that causes a lot of angst in the system. In fact, currently, if you look at, uh, and how is that manifested? Very often you will find that manifested. Let us say today, uh, we have a case going on against a police officer in Mumbai police. And you have a similar case going on in the US against somebody who uh, you know, is accused of uh, killing George Floyd. Both these cases are going on together. Now in both these cases, you will find, who are we holding accountable? We are in both cases holding two categories of people accountable. One is we are holding the person concerned, which is rightly so. The person involved in the crime is being held accountable. And next, we hold the right person on top accountable, the commissioner of police accountable. Now, this reflects a certain uh, problem in the way the organization is structured and it's going to be managed. According to Elliot Jacks, if the policeman at the ground level has committed a problem, then you ought to hold the person immediately above him accountable. What was that person doing when the initial signals were coming in about the behavior of that police officer? If you would have immediately held that immediate manager accountable, and that was the system in the organization, then things perhaps would not have reached that state that now you would need to have such a big issue to deal with. You will find this happens in many organizations that accountability is not put where it should be. And part of that is because authority is not given where it should be. So it's more like a chicken and egg problem, which uh, Jax thinks that we should solve. He also adds a little bit about what should be the role of A. According to A, according to Jax, B cannot be the person who judges when C should be promoted to B's grade. Because B, having been at that stratum, cannot conceptualize when C will be ready for that stratum. So succession planning, growth, career development of C should be done by the manager once removed because A knows what is expected of the stratum that B belongs to. Remember, A, B, and C are in three different strata. So only A knows what he or she expects from stratum B. And hence, he can be the right person to judge when C is ready for B, B's job. Now we come to the part of uh, judging the capability of people. How do we judge the capability of people? Now here again, uh, Jax has a very interesting take on it. He says there are four things we need to judge when we are assessing a candidate for a particular role. The first is capability. 
capability is defined as the length of time a person can work without direction so if you're in an interview you can ask people questions like what is the longest project that you took up what are the kind of jobs that you did in your earlier role how much time did you have to plan your work before your supervisor intervened and uh, you know checked your work so that defines the length of time a person can work into the future it is called as time horizon similar to time span of discretion the next is what is the person's information information processing capacity remember we spoke about uh, complexity number of variables change of variables rate of change of variables interactions amongst variables so that is something we need to see how many variables can this person handle how much complexity can this person handle and finally what is the kind of effectiveness of decision making and problem solving this is then coupled with skill so obviously skill is required if you're working in a finance job you need to understand finance if you're in manufacturing you need to understand manufacturing there has to be some interest in the job and finally he talks about uh, habits and absence of extreme negative temperament these are things like emotional issues personality issues etc these should not come in the way this capability gives us the person's potential capability that means what is the extent to which this person can work at what level can this person work and the person's applicable capability is a subset of this actually even though the 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 uh, brackets are showing a larger thing the applicable capability will be smaller than the potential capability because the potential capability is then have to be factored in along with the skill the interest the passion and the reasonable uh, behavior the person may have capability but if the person has less skill less interest less reasonable behavior or some problems in that department then the applicable capability will become smaller and smaller but essentially the potential capability sets the limit this perhaps uh, to my mind is the most uh, controversial part of eliot jacks entire body of work according to eliot jacks one can assess a human being at the age of 20 25 determine which stratum the person fits in based on various tests and i'll share some of them with you and once you have determined which stratum the person is in then pretty much the person's trajectory is predictable so there are some thumb rules that typically one to move from one stratum to another it takes about 10 to 15 years so as human beings age we mature and our capability matures at the rate of one stratum for every 15 20 years now most of us will have let us say 30 years career which means that we will be able to jump two or three strata at the most uh, in our careers what that means is pretty much at 2025 once your st uh, st current stratum is decided then your career trajectory that means what you will be when you're 60 years old is pretty much decided this uh, goes slightly against our conventional humanistic principles that people have infinite capacity and are capable of doing everything as long as you train them and this can be a little hard hitting uh, particularly for uh, you know many people who are very deeply rooted in this kind of humanistic kind of thought Uh, but when we give it some thought uh, you i think most of us realize that not all of us uh, either want to be or have it in us to deal with the kind of complexity that a ceo's job would entail right so i think this is something which uh, can be slightly discomforting in eliot jacks's uh, view but he holds to this very strongly and there are many managers who also subscribe to this particular view uh there are three commercially available techniques uh, to assess capability these are uh, marketed by an organization called bios which uh, started off based on eliot jacks work one is called as a career path appreciation in which a trained uh, person would actually uh, interview the individual i'm told it goes over days one or two days and then based on that the person would be able to assess your current and future capability there is another modified career appreciation which is an online assessment followed up by a short telephonic interview typically in these they look at what has been your past work experience for freshers they have a tool called as the initial recruitment interview schedule iris which again uh, helps you to assess the kind of complexity that individuals can handle and the kind of uh, decision making style that they have 
the last part of uh, Elliot Jack's contribution when it comes to felt fair pay. As I explained, the way he worked this out was trying to look at what is it that people felt was fair to be paid to senior managers. Now, if you look at the way we normally decide our compensation, we start with job evaluation, then we do some kind of benchmarking and we come up with a final salary. But what is the objective of our entire uh, compensation decision? The objective of our entire decision is that there should be internal and external equity. That means people who are in the organization should feel that they have been felt fairly, they've been paid fairly. And this is the point at which Elliot Jacks uh, uses in order to determine felt fair pay. In my view, this particular uh, uh, felt fair pay may be slightly co contextualized based on the geography in which the research was done and also based on the time in which the research was done. So it may change as social attitudes, et cetera, towards pay change. But definitely when he did his work, this was the kind of felt fair pay. So if you see, he says that, okay, whatever is the salary in stratum one, in stratum two, it should be one and a half times, stratum three, it should be three times and so on. Uh, quite interesting, I noticed that uh, there is one more individual, uh, which is Chanakya or Kautilya in his Arthashastra. In one of his chapters, he again gives a similar formula. And instead of X, 1.5X, he says that uh, the person at the lowest level should be given so many kilos of rice. And uh, then based on that, the uh, senior officer should be given so much more and then the king and, you know, he goes on, which is similar to this Elliot Jack's kind of approach, which uh, again, some organizations may want to try out. So there are three things that we've looked at. One is we've looked at the person's capability or capacity to work. We have looked at the complexity involved in the work. And third is we have looked at the pay that the person gets. Now, based on these three variables, you have here 13 combinations, which I've clustered into three buckets. The first is equilibrium. Equilibrium is when my capacity is certain amount and the work that I'm doing is matched to my capacity. According to Elliot Jacks, that's when I will be in flow. That means I'll be happy and I'll be fully self-expressed because my capacity is matched to the complexity of the work that I'm doing. Instead of that, if I'm in this zone, where my work complexity is much more than my personal capacity, I will feel burnout, overstretch, etc. And in the last case, my capacity is very high, but the work that I'm doing is very low complexity. I will feel understretched. I will feel I'm not used to the fullest extent. I will feel bored in the work. And then coupled to that, you add the third variable, which is your pay. That is, is your pay equitable or not? Now, if you apply these concepts, which Elliot Jacks has said, your probability of coming close to something like this that means your work capacity, uh, your, your own working capacity, the complexity of your work and your pay are completely in alignment. And that, that is like the ideal situation to work for. Most of us would be in one of these 13. Uh, each one of us can figure out where we fall. And that is not an ideal situation for us. Okay, so finally, we've uh, looked at, uh, we started off with work complexity. And we said Elliot Jack's key insight was that work complexity is not a continuous scale. It's a discrete scale, ice, water, steam. And then based on that, we have an org structure where the manager has to be one stratum higher as compared to the subordinate. This gives us uh, the time span of discretion, which helps us to diagnose how complex is the work. It helps us to create an org structure at those discrete levels where there is going to be a breakage. This also gives us the idea of accountability and authority. What should be the relationship between manager and subordinate? Then we looked at human capability, which can be assessed again using time span of discretion. And outcome of all this is what constitutes a fair reward. The strengths of Elliot Jack's method, as you may have figured out by now, is consistency. He's consistent with his framework and it applies pervasively across various domains. There is some simplicity and elegance to his framework, and it's extremely practical. He's talking about the problems that we face in organizations on a day-to-day -day basis. But there are some concerns with Elliot Jack's approaches, which I must highlight. Uh, these are, uh, one is that some people see it as too mechanistic. They feel that it is slightly old economy. Remember, Elliot Jack started his career sometime around 1950s. 
and his career went on up to around i think 2002 or so bulk of his work was done in the 50s 60s and 70s and some people criticize elliot jacks for not having uh, you know uh, his work not being too applicable to some of the new kind of roles that are coming in elliot jacks refutes this in one of his interviews and uh, you know criticizes his detractors but that is a criticism which we need to table the third criticism which to my mind at least as an academic is the biggest criticism is that most of uh, elliot jacks evidence while he talks about that i found evidence that this is related to felt fair pay etc he doesn't share that evidence to with us so normally in the academic tradition people publish journals articles where things are peer reviewed like you may have seen during the corona virus etc people come up with drugs they share the data of their drug efficacy there is a peer review and then it gets published in that case the entire recipe is available for you anybody else can replicate it but uh, in case of elliot jacks uh, partly perhaps because he felt that it is this is, should not be publicly given otherwise people will start labeling each other uh, as in terms of what is their capability partly because he was also a consultant and he wanted to keep the uh, methods proprietary a lot of his methods are proprietary which means if you read his books you understand the concept you you get a broad idea but then it leads you to finally okay get somebody who is trained in this get a consultant to do it for us so that's the third part where uh, uh, you know which i think is a concern yeah so this is my last slide uh, these are some resources those of you who are interested uh, the first three are books which i found particularly useful there are a host of other books elliot jacks has written almost 23 books uh, requisite organization is like a you know a, a repository of almost everything that is of use to people like us uh, executive leadership is another book i particularly enjoyed the third book by tom foster is good because it gives you very practical tips of how to do this capability interview on your own Uh, the names on the right hand side are names of people who have been associated with elliot jacks or who have worked or who are trained in his technique there are many more these are some of the people i could come across and uh, uh, the kaysen hall and company are the people who publish his books bios is the organization which is the most popular organization using elliot jacks and his work these are some of the other consulting firms which uh, you know use his work i'm sure there are many more again this is not an exhaustive list also this is more like an introduction not a recommendation because i have not used their services but uh, these are just people whom i came across and uh, finally yeah thanks to mr satish pradhan and mr sunil ganesh who supported me in preparing this talk so thank you all for your patience i hope we are in time yes rubin uh, it's not a matter of patience we've thoroughly enjoyed what we heard from you and uh, we really appreciate the passion with which which you have researched this topic at such depth and the entire flow of your presentation was indeed praiseworthy mm. uh, may i request that we can close your presentation so that we can have slightly more contact with all our participants who sure. are eager to discuss with you whatever could be possible in the remaining time span that is available with us so one of the first questions i have zubin which is coming from the chat box and others are welcome is this very fundamental question are we looking at different approaches when it comes to larger organizations and different approaches when it comes to small and medium enterprises given that the theory is constant how would the application vary right so according to elliot jacks the when you enter an organization the first thing you need to decide is what kind of work is the ceo doing now in many cases the ceo may be doing a stratum 4 job which means he may be like a plant manager where he'll be managing a unit which is fairly self contained where there is you know uh, stratum 4 means 2 to 5 years is the time span of discretion so the entire organization will be a subset of that so you start off with the ceo there'll be other organizations where you may have stratum 5 or stratum 6 and there'll be these large mega corporations which may be stratum 7 and in some of his works i've also seen him adding a stratum 8 where in those days he would say that general motors ge etc would be in stratum 8 today i guess they would say amazon and microsoft would be in that stratum 8 but he's also added a stratum 8 to accommodate those mega corporations so he says you start off with the ceo analyze the kind of work that the ceo is doing 
and then that becomes the limit of that organization and then you work downward but the theory is consistent it still stay remains fair i think that that's a very nice way of explaining it i hand over to a very senior industry veteran from the field of human resources mr visti banaji good evening sir and welcome to this webinar i hand over to you to share your views please go ahead thank you professor uh, first thank you for arranging these wonderful sessions i have expressed it in some groups also and i will repeat that uh, once again my thanks to zubin he is invariably a fund of information and for those of us who are not in regular touch with uh, academia he is he is a source of uh, uh, information and inspiration so thank you zubin uh, i have um, um thanks to you been able to refresh some of my memories of elliot jacks as we used to try and implement him uh, many decades back and which reminded me of some of the problems we faced with his methodology and i'd like to pose one or two of them to you uh, for your uh, guidance so one is that while time span is um a very sturdy concept uh using time span alone um perhaps ignores some of the things which in practical life we need to take care of so i'll i'll just take an example that it's one thing to have a long future um kind of drawing board but at the same time the cost of an error also makes a huge difference to the uh, evaluation we would do of jobs the amount we'd pay for them so for example an airline pilot while his time span of dic discretion may be whatever 2 hours he is flying but by virtue of the fact that he can kill 150 people or uh, damage uh, millions of dollars worth of plane uh, we we rate that job relatively highly and pay the person also so this is somewhere at least when we tried to use his method of evaluation we we came up with this deficiency i mean i won't go into how we overcame it but um uh, i'll i'll just mention one more point and then uh, shut up is this whole concept of pressure and whether pressure indeed rises as one goes up the um time span of discretion is somewhat questionable i mean you've several times used the uh, reference to bezos and if i may somewhat uh, facetiously think that if bezos doesn't want to do something today and he does it tomorrow the very fact that he's going to be evaluated 3 or 7 years down the line makes it possible for him to do that but here's this zomato guy whose time span of discretion is far far shorter but if he doesn't land up in time either he will get sacked or he'll get into the news for some um uh, untoward reason and uh, so it seems to me that actually the pressure is more on the person who is uh, at the lower reaches of the time span and i'd be grateful for your guidance on these two uh, questions okay so uh, first i'll give you my two bit on that uh, pilot point so my understanding is that uh, elliot jacks uh, talked about managerial accountability hierarchy uh, not uh, you know this uh, the expert kind of role so for example people like surgeons and pilots uh, to my mind do not strictly fit into uh, the no zoom in let me come in there i mean i gave pilot just as a thought which came to right. me Right. but even in the managerial hierarchy uh, there is a person whose decision today can cause a huge cost versus so it's not just the time by which i will be found out it is how much that decision so we can leave surgeons and pilots out we right. can take a, a a process designer versus an hr person versus someone else and in all of them there is also a cost to the decision which i am saying the jacks approach ignores right i i agree they ignore that uh, my understanding is that the time span of discretion is a measurement it's like the level at which the mercury rises in the thermometer 
what is the underlying thing is you are measuring the energy or the heat in the body the heat in the body is represented by the thermometer level now in such cases where the time span of discretion does not represent the complexity of work if at all there is such because he claims that in most of the jobs that he saw the time span of discretion represents it but that is not a theory that's an empirical observation which means he says that this i found as correlated with this and then he begins justifying and explaining it the underlying theory where he talks about the quality of the decision making the abstractness the nature of the decision that he's making where he talks about those four levels declarative cumulative sequential and parallel processing at that level then you have to go back into that so perhaps you need to go back to fundamentals if the uh, if the tool does not work so it is possible that the tool does not work in some cases but then we need to go back to fundamentals regarding the second uh, point about the pressure faced by the person uh, again elliot jacks uh, work up, apart from the first stratum where he you know kind of dismisses all the other roles and then he starts into the managerial role he focuses pra, 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 uh, i think heavily on the intellectual challenge which overwhelms the individual so it's like you know the kind of variables that Je Je uh, jeff bezos needs to imagine when he's looking at his you know uh, business 20 years hence the sheer number of variables may overwhelm a lesser person a person not having that kind of capability Uh, but i agree with you there are other pressures which may affect uh, individuals which uh, are not captured in the pure intellectual challenge of solving the problem thank you thank you i now move to another uh, veteran in the field of human resources so whom zubin just acknowledged thank you satish pradhan ji for joining us here this evening nice to have you back on the bma platform uh, may i hand over to you to continue the discussion thank you very much uh, can you uh, hear me yes please yeah uh, thank you very much uh, professor mani and uh, zubin uh, i i will only add uh, to vistis uh, appreciation of uh, both your endeavor and your output uh, as usual clarity crispness insight and a vast uh, accumulated uh, Uh, knowledge and information base and insights that you've provided uh, would be extremely helpful to all of us and was to me as a reminder of many things two quick uh, points that i'd like to put on the table as experienced uh, by me in uh, my work that i've done and uh, my association with what i would call the work levels theory which um, uh, includes but is not limited to elliot's a uh, stratified uh, theory as he calls it or the requisite organization uh, predominantly to mention to uh, contributors to what uh, i have as an understanding is gillian stamps work which humanizes a lot of the criticism you talked about in terms of the mechanistic uh, steel clad uh, scaffolding which is like a prison rather than a liberating enabler etc and the marriage with uh, chits mihail mihaili's notion of flow and the human context of unleashing potential and uh, causing a, a degree of happiness if you will uh, in people who work in organizations uh, which have a hierarchy of some kind uh, my experience has been with the first attempt that we came across with uh, uh, this uh, theory in in um, um ici plc uh which uh, played with a lot of these ideas in a fairly substantive way in the late 80s then early 90s uh and then also the the attempt that concurrently went on with unilever and these were two totally different ways of implementing and making sense and the third more recently in this century was my awareness of what had been happening and what was happening in tesco so three commercial organizations the uh, experiments in south africa by gillian where there was no surrogate of a cv or an past experience of skills and competence in a corporate or similar world but complete uneducated black uh, sorry uh, people of color uh, uh, talent if you will call them that 
from whom ministers and responsible roles are to be filled by the dismantling of apartheid uh, all the way through to the us army and i think i referenced a paper to you on on what work the us army began to do with this and how they so all of this practical part of it tells me one thing uh the steel frame as you take it from elliot is of little practical value uh interesting concepts and at best as rishi said uh, they can guide you to make your choices uh, none of these can be treated as non negotiable except one principle i think and that's something worth the audience uh, thinking about you cannot have a reporting relationship in the, the same work level right uh that to my mind i have experienced as sacred the rest of it is somewhat malleable and contextual and needs to be worked around sure great thank you so much for adding to the wisdom of this session which has been wonderful uh, thanks to zubin and all the research that you put in i now hand over to shri vithal acharya he's posted a question and i'd request him to please uh, ask the question himself over to you vithal thank you so much really appreciate this uh, opportunity to join this Zubin, it was very incisive, very intuitive, uh, appealing um, uh, concept. Uh, one quick question is: You did mention that there is no peer research that's going on. Uh, is there any basis of his understanding or research on the capability part? How did he discover yeah, so, so those that, trajectories? Uh, yeah. So the difficulty with uh, Elliot Jacks is that one is uh, he's written these twenty-three books. not all of which are easily available so they are available but you need to struggle a lot and some of them are quite expensive etc so i was able to get my hands on about 5 of his books uh -huh. uh, but there are still 18 more which i have not been able to get my hands on sure sure the other thing is that uh, even in the books you know he will talk about the findings he will not share the data and the analysis with you okay and that for us as academics is little uh, you know uh, we we are little skeptical of that when it's people black publish books ha huh, it's a black box and uh, he also his the tone tends to be little i would like to say unscientific it's you know there are three and only three that's how he write that's how his book is written you know there are three and only three uh, reasons or ways in which this can happen yeah. and so on yeah. so that yeah. can put put us off sometimes yeah. because uh, then it sometimes seems as if these are just like you know uh, uh, pr material right of course it's too rich to be called that i'm just uh, making it very yeah. simple but then after yeah. some time you feel that we okay fine now how do i go to the next level the next level okay now you contact bio so you contact some expert etc all of whom i have good good heard good recommendations about so nothing uh, but you know it's like you you can't then create it on your own so he's got written a book called human capability where he talks about some of these things uh, which i don't have access to but i'm told that's uh, good and there again okay the other thing is he will talk about this glacier uh, metallurgy company so it will be in one organization where he's done this and he's come up with this conclusion and then that's going to be for everybody all the way and that's where yeah. some people have a problem with that correct thank you so all much right. subin thanks subin and as we always say sometimes we need to pause on the learning process to digest reflect and then try to see how we can put to practice Zubin has been very gracious in sharing his presentation with us and I, I assure you that the presentation will be shared with all the registered participants of this wonderful talk that Zubin led for us this evening may i request who my reward regard as one of our youngest learners in this group the person who is instrumental in suggesting that we get Zubin here this evening May I request our past president and a very senior member of the Bombay Management Association, Sri Indrapal Singh Ji, to make his observations and also thank Zubin for being here with us this evening. Over to you, Indrapal Ji. Yeah, thank you, Professor Mani, for agreeing to my suggestion of having Zubin. And uh, now everyone would have realized that uh, what a uh, what a person with a good academic mind and sound thinking. can do in terms of bringing clarity to elliot jacks complicated and difficult to understand difficult to understand usage of language etc and bring about clarity of his concepts so zubin thank you very much for simplifying and clarifying uh, slightly abstruse uh, 
concepts of Eliot Jack. My first brush was with him when Professor Ishwar Dayal at IMA in 1967-68 uh, time frame when we were very young, uh, you know, we were the third batch, uh, used to take Glacier Metals Incorporated as a seven series case. And let me confess that we hardly understood anything as it is Professor Ishwar Dayal was the Dayan of his field, a, a true professor and highly complicated. And having worked at the Tavistock Institute himself, you can imagine the plight of uh, in Ahmedabad summer and cyclostyle copies of paper and, uh, uh, you know, asbestos roof sheets, etc. on the top uh, to understand what Elliot Jacques was saying and his work with Wilfred Brown at uh, the thing. But anyway, that interest remained because later on when we learned formal organizational behavior and other things, structure with Tarun Sheikh and Dr. Anand and others, we realized that Elliot Jacques was far above the traditional, I don't know what is the text this year using Coons and Dr. Nall or Stephen Robbins or what have you. So he was much beyond that. Never understood it fully, I mean, even for years. Then when I started using, uh, became the head of the business, then I realized that India Jack was quite right. I mean, you know, how do we, whom do we put at what level, how much increment we give, how much we promote him, how do we supervise, why people are not able to set the right goals and so on and so forth. All the questions you clarified beautifully. So again, we did a little bit of uh, digging and that's when you were there. We were trying to bring up that machine tool business. So how do we do that? And then interest remained. I tried to sell these ideas to various people, but they found it was far too complicated. And I never had the patience or rather capability also to simplify it like you did. If you were uh, involved in that time in this thing, I suppose we would have made much more progress. But uh, then lately also I followed up and uh, I bought, uh, got connected with this ro.org or whatever, refugee.org and bought a couple of other books, the latest publications. I realized that this age, age, uh, age time, um, uh, age Maturities. capability curves, the Japanese actually borrowed from Elliot Jack and used in the corporation. And if you really read the statements of Mitsubishi head, and you would read that uh, Mr. Uh, Matsushita would think of 50 years future, so it is mm. not that the Japanese thought about the 50 years future, but they borrowed that concept from uh, Elliot Chak and implemented. And similarly, that autonomy of the work, uh, this thing, the Japanese implemented first. So this is what uh, various researchers later on the found out. And uh, uh, so many interesting stories were there. Actually, Wilfred Brown's uh, books also, if you read about equitable pay and the policy making, he was a minister himself. Uh, so they, they are highly intellectual and joy to read. For example, the way work Wilfred Brown describes in his book is absolutely fabulous. I mean, those anybody who wants to understand the, the question that you asked earlier should uh, see Wilfred Brown's book on the subject. So I would say that I think still it has a huge potential, this uh, India Jack work, uh, you know, in terms of solving our organization problems. See, India is a, we are bereft with the, every organization that is almost dysfunctional. You know, it doesn't work properly. And the problems yeah. are like this, you know, how do we know what is the cognitive capability? I know they're coming from Central European paradigm. So there is intellectual and philosophical uh, things woven into it, unlike American, which is straightforward or Japanese, you know, which is somewhat different. So it's difficult to follow this European right. tradition, right. but look at the rigor, look at the applicability of it in, in solving the problem. You described the Bombay uh, current case and uh, elsewhere in the US and so on. And, and the, I think this misery is, because we are not following the rigor to design our organizations yeah. properly. And that's why people are miserable, outputs are not correct, and so on. <clears throat> and about the stress level that you talk in uh, some of the later work, but very nice graph is there. With, uh, on the y-axis is uh, the capability, and the uh, uh, x-axis is the capability, and the y is the challenge. And according to him, that line should no. be diagonal. Yeah. That means if your capability is uh, low and challenge is high, you will have that stress you know, anger, this, that, and the other, and your capability is high, but the challenge is low, then you'll have frustration or other things. So how yeah. do you design that match between capability and challenge uh, is also brought about. So I believe like Dr. Deming wrote to him, Ilya Jack, there's one letter I happened to read, that uh, he, this is a system. He said his work is a system and it is not an approach or anything. And therefore it is wonderful. And some of the principles that Dr. Deming taught Japan, apparently, it looks like now in the retrospect, he might have borrowed from Elliot Jacques' work. So That's if really you combine uh, Deming, Jacques, uh, which is Deming, a purely American tradition of statistical control, etc., 
with the insight of Jacques and you had great new uh, paradigm of managing things, you know, with rigor and concern for human well-being and so on. In fact, when I read a couple of uh, papers written by Wilfred Brown and uh, India Jack, the fairness or equitability, equi equitability comes across as a major value of that one. They, they were very worried about fairness, that how do we pay people fairly? How do we put them in a fair, deal with them a fair way, put in the right positions and so on. So I think all the problems that uh, enlightened uh, practitioners should be worried about, you know, the issues that are we fair, are we getting uh, a youth, uh, a, a, we are getting maximum potential out of people using them accordingly, deploying them accordingly, are addressed by this theory in some way. Like you rightly said, there can be, there could have been time compression now that 50 years in view of technology change could be, uh, you know, now 20 years or whatever. Uh, so all those could be done. But I think the logic of it, uh, the principles of accountability, authority, task complexity, cognitive capability, information processing capability, are all, I think, immensely valid today. Absolutely. So once again, thank you so much. And I hope you will find uh, some PhD students and the new to do more research and find more successful applications. You know, and we would say that we were, we have failed Elliot Shark, you know, in some way, not taken through his thing. But I suppose there's a huge potential there. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Mari. Thank you, you very much, Indrapalji. Not at all, sir. Thank you very much, Indrapalji. I think... Uh, Zubin, the least we can do for you is clap virtually, but clap really. It was just a wonderful session, and we look forward to more learning opportunities like this.